Hello, this is Stephanie. And this is Brian. Welcome to the making and the remaking of A Codependent Mind. We're going to pick up this time with another tool for our uh, relationship toolbox. And this is going to be about the topic of curiosity. Last episode, we talked about the kind of work we do to maintain our relationship. And we put that work into three categories. Work that's done in order to increase our knowledge and understanding of each other, of ourselves, and of the relationship. That's one category. And then another category was work that we do to stay connected to each other. And then the third category was work that we did to strengthen the partnership and the sense of partnership between us. And curiosity is a tool that can really be used with work in any of those three categories. Although I would say that maybe particularly with the knowledge understanding category and the staying connected category. Before we get to using the tool, how we use it, also how you need it in some ways to learn or relearn right. how to use the tool of curiosity in relationships. Let's do our kind of standard, what is curiosity? What is it? Right, exactly. Yeah, let's, let's just talk about the, the idea of curiosity itself. So you, you're the philosophy major. So tell us something about what curiosity is from a philosophical point of view. Sure. Although I'm no longer a philosophy major. That was a number of years ago, but yes. <laughs> um, one way to, when you start to think about the particular meaning of a word or of a phenomena, I do like to look to philosophy because there's very often some very smart people who have said things about it. So... For instance, we have a philosopher, David Hume, who had a lot to say about emotions and the role of emotions in our lives. He describes it as that love of truth that was the source of all our inquiries, an emotion akin to love that would drive our inquiring minds. Then there's philosopher and psychologist, an early psychologist, William James, who calls curiosity, quote, the impulse towards better cognition as this desire to understand what you do not currently know. So for Hume, it's this love that drives inquiry. James, it's this desire that drives better cognition. Um, If we look at Hobbes, he also describes curiosity as a passion. And he sees curiosity as a particularly a human trait Quote, such as in no living creature but man, so that man is distinguished not only by his reason, but also by the singular passion from other animals. So with him as well, we see this combination between this emotional and this intellectual component of curiosity. So that curiosity becomes a kind of animating emotion behind our desire to know, to think, to discover. I think what you've done here, which is already incredibly useful for me, is that I've never really looked at curiosity as an emotion, as something that's really connected to emotions, obviously because of my history of not really connecting my emotions to almost anything. I mean, to me, curiosity and is just linked to rationalization. <laughs> but these, these right here, it's like, yeah, right. When I think about people that are that seem to be especially curious. It seems to be driven by something like love or passion or desire. And we'll talk about it in a bit, what that emotion feels like. Emotions and feelings often, those two words are conflated because we see emotions as kind of emanating from the body in the way that thoughts do not, right? It feels like something when you're curious. We'll talk a little bit about what that is. But I did want to discuss a little bit Hobbes' claim that... It's a singular passion that it kind of distinguishes us from other animals. Because he was a philosopher, Thomas Hobbes is a philosopher from the 1500s. So this was a long time ago, Mm -hmm. before there was a real science of the natural world, obviously way before Darwin and evolution. So there's been a lot of research and scholarship into the behavior of animals, for instance. And a lot of them display, a lot of them act in a way that we would describe as curious we would describe as displaying curiosity. So the most common one that jumps to mind is the the cat, of course. The curiosity killing the cat. Right, so there's an example where people see in cats this behavior that looks like curiosity. And in fact, in terms of 
looking at the behaviors across what we call the tree of life, which describes every kind of organism that we see as being alive, exploratory behavior is one of the fundamental traits of animals. So we would, it's kind of everywhere across the animal kingdom. So we would presume that these traits, this exploratory behavior, whatever drives it, would influence positively their chance of survival, among other things. Right, yeah. It's deeply rooted because it was actually useful. It was selected for. So, and we can kind of see why that would be the case. The ability to explore an environment can uncover new resources, can give you a leg up on competitors or predators or your prey. I mean, obviously, as we hear with the cats, (laughs) too much curiosity can also make it such that the organism gets itself into trouble and is not successful (laughs) in the battle for survival. So it's not always, as with almost all of our behaviors and our emotions, it's not that you want the maximum amount of curiosity mm. in a particular organism or animal or situation. So that potentially is a distinguishing factor of human curiosity. And we heard that in, say, Hume's description of curiosity or James's description of curiosity. Our ability to marry this exploratory instinct with our reason and maybe make this decision. Like we're feeling curious, we want to explore, but maybe this isn't the right situation for us to do that. Yes, right. Being able to kind of think ahead of time, what are the limitations or the risks? And it's also possible that we have a greater curiosity than other animals. And I was reading about a study that describes that, where they took apes and young children, say, children from two to three, because very often those are understood as being kind of having equal intellectual resources. Yes. And then they diverge. <laughs> then, yeah, we, we, you know, young children get, get better and apes stay where they are in terms mm-hmm. of their cognitive capabilities. Anyway, so they took these two groups and they put in front of them, I, I can't exactly remember particulars, but it was something like they put in front of them two overturned bowls that had something underneath. One of the bowls was transparent and one of them was opaque. So you couldn't see what was underneath. You didn't know what you were going to get. And apes always, 100%, went for the transparent. So they were not curious or curious enough to give up what they saw under that bowl for what might be under the second bowl. Behind door number two. (laughs) They never went for door number two. There was a... What was the... TV game show that uh, had yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah, was that Price is Right? No, no uh, it, was it wasn't Price is Right. No, it was older one. Like, yeah, Let's Make a Deal. Let's Make a Deal, right? Yeah. Where you were like, you can have this or you can choose. Right, and you door number two. And then there's so, like a donkey or something. Yeah. <laughs> or a car. Yeah, that right. was the thing, right? The baby, the babies or infants or small toddlers consistently or not infrequently chose the opaque. Yeah. So they were curious. Yeah, sure. So they'll give up whatever they see under that bowl to see. Oh, but I really want to know, right? So it is perhaps, we're not the only ones that do exploratory behavior, but perhaps we are somewhat unique in in the the level of our desire to know Mm -hmm. and to be curious. And then also in our maybe ability to use our reason to decide whether that's advantageous to us. I really like that this is children that we're talking about. So this is something that is just, it's... Baked in. Yeah pretty much baked in right we, we come out that way um, i'm sure to to various degrees i mean yeah. you're going to see some children even very young children who are more comfortable engaging in exploratory behavior or curious behavior than others so in the literature of evolution of curiosity it is not only tied to our our that being humans capacity to learn we are really learning machines and that it, the curiosity is an important component of that, that desire to get out and know. Then we bring it back to ourselves and then are able to incorporate it at a level that other animals are not so much able to incorporate what we've learned. It also is described as being connected to our deep sense of attachment to each other, which is also somewhat unique. I mean, you see that in other animals, especially the animals that are closer to us in the evolutionary tree, but our pair bonds, our bonds with our immediate family and our extended family, our social and community bonds are very strong. And social curiosity can really facilitate that and facilitate cooperation and the sharing of knowledge. Right. Okay. Which has been so critical 
to human communities and their evolution. Yeah. So wanting to know things about your neighbor or your father or your, yeah. Wanting to know about the people around you as much as you want to know about yourself. And then wanting to know about the world and bringing that back and sharing it with those people as well. So that everyone's environment is is enriched. And it strikes me the way we're talking about curiosity is kind of similar to how we talked about empathy. You know, empathy is thought of as an emotion, something that we feel, but it has this cognitive component. It also requires the ability to imagine what other people's experiences are like, what they're going through. And then it has this action component where we expect an action to come out of that. And in that episode, we talked about the way that your empathy was blunted by your childhood experiences. Would you say that it's fair to say that similar thing happened with curiosity? Yeah, right. I mean, it's a similar thing with pretty much every emotion. And I can point to specific things about each of them that are a little different, but it, it's all kind of coming from the same experiences, more or less. In my case, with curiosity, big examples that jump into my head that would have gone all the way back to the beginning would be, you know, we're talking about children. This is something that children do. You know, they ask a lot of questions. They're, they, they're, they don't know what the things around them are, and they're asking their care- caregivers questions. What is this? And I remember asking my dad a lot of questions and if he didn't have a very ready or very quick response, he would get, he would get frustrated in himself and then immediately turn that frustration on me for making him frustrated more or less is kind of what it seemed like. I don't have, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So he gets flustered and gets angry and then, then starts sort of lashes out and blames me for feeling that frustration in that I'm argumentative. I'm asking too many questions, things like that. So I'm being told to not be curious. So that's an explicit example of the way your curiosity was blunted, discouraged. Yeah, so that's one piece. And then I carry that out. And then, of course, the friendship G that we talk about, it was very risky to be curious, really, in any way. I didn't feel safe knowing what was going on with him. I just needed to do what it was I thought I was expected to do. So I let him tell me what that was. If I asked anything... It would be kind of a similar thing, except he was much more extreme than my dad. Just, what are you asking me this for? Just, it just was extremely unsafe. I would be met with violence. So those were external pressures on you to not be curious, to not explore the external world. And then you also had some internal mechanisms that made it difficult to be curious. Yeah, so I think it starts with the action, right? It starts by, with me, by removing the action. So now, so I, I don't find it safe to take the action of being curious. So then I have to turn it inwards too, because it's really difficult to be curious because we all are and not be able to take any action on it. And so I think that's where I continue to carry the torch of this process of, of basically turning off because there's also the whole, you know, I didn't feel safe having desires or wants and and needs and we talked about in the, ep- the empathy episode, you didn't feel safe feeling empathy. So we have these emotions, and some of them are very motivating emotions, or we could call them animating emotions. Oh, yeah, I like that, animating. Yeah. So they're there to animate us, to drive action. And, and like you're describing, when we can't satisfy that, it can be very painful and difficult. Absolutely, so, yeah, yeah. So you learn to turn off those difficult, challenging emotions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So empathy, like you just said, empathy, things like anger, you know, I didn't feel safe expressing anger because I didn't think I'd be able to successfully out anger (laughs) the other people around me that were more angry. So similar with the curiosity. So I'm just going to turn it inwards and and just kind of, uh, yeah, I'm just going with the flow. I'm just, I'm, so now instead of looking for what I want or what I'm curious about, I'm waiting for information to come to me, expectations to come my way. Just that's what I was getting used to. In the last episode, when we were talking about work and how children have shouldn't have to do work in the relationship with their caregivers and the ways that you did have to do work, you had a job or jobs in your relationship with your dad and in your relationship with your mom. When really the, the work you needed to be doing, the job you should have had was exploring your world and learning about your world and your place in it. Yeah, right. That's pretty much what children's job is, I think that's what children's job is, is (laughs) that's the most important work. And the work that we can do as adults is to help them do that work, is to help them 
feel safe and empowered to explore their world and their role in it. But you were focused so much on these external threats. And that just carried through all the way through your life. You were in yeah. threat response mode, not in curiosity mode. Yes, right. And a word that keeps popping on my head lately is performance mode too. I'm not looking for something that I necessarily desire or want. I'm looking at what is going to maximize my safety. So, ah, this, like we've mentioned before, like playing piano or something, you know, I was, maybe you should try taking piano. Okay. You're suggesting this, I'll do it. And, and I didn't realize partially in that I didn't enjoy it, but I just kept at it because this is a, a want that someone, or this is a desire that someone told me I should have. But someone else, but this is a desire someone else had for you. So for you me. just would substitute in. So it wasn't, you weren't animated by your own curiosity about music or playing the piano, by any sense of playfulness or play or mm -hmm. creativity. It, it was performance for you. And it was about performing to neutralize the threat of someone being disappointed if you didn't. Right. Not even, but also it's kind of an interesting situation to think about too, because my mom didn't necessarily give me any reason to be afraid to say, I don't like this, but I already assumed based on my wider experiences that it was just unsafe in general with everyone. So, you know, you mentioned, what is the feeling of curiosity? What does it feel like? So you mentioned one side of it. If it's unresolved or unresolvable, it can feel painful. Yeah, yeah. What's, a, what's an example? Like, well, I, I mean, I think actually it's easier if, if we make analogies. So I would say it's similar to having an itch you cannot scratch. I uh, mean, that's the physical analogy, which I think actually is very similar. I think also we were talking the other day about recognizing people, but not knowing who they were, oh, how that right. worked. Uh, yeah. So I think having being curious about something that you can't resolve is similar to trying to remember something that you know you know oh yeah huh i hate that feeling don't it's you hate that annoying. feeling yeah i mean you can keep you up at night literally like yeah. who was that actress in that movie i know i know that person right right thank god we have the internet now oh, i know right <laughs> <Because> <laughs> that's a really that can be a very unpleasant feeling yeah and right. same thing with curiosity so i mean it's a little different if you're well i'm super curious to know that but i know if i try to figure that out like it's gonna, it's not gonna go well and deciding to kind of put it out of your mind. Even, but that's still hard to do. It is, yeah. You know, your child is rife with examples as you're describing it of feeling some level of emotional pain and not knowing how to process it or manage it. So just disassociating, depressing those emotions, compartmentalizing those emotions. And then of course, the whole cascade, which we've talked, we talked about extensively in season one and season two, what happens to all the emotions that they all get... They all get depressed and they all get compartmentalized. They all get confusing and, and none of them are accessible and, or understandable. Right. That's the one component is you experience the pain of feeling curious without thinking that you, because you had this lack of agency, this powerlessness feeling that you could resolve it. And then, so I'm not going to feel curious at all. Right. It's difficult to inhabit that feeling for very long. So, so yeah, I had to come up with strategies to not feel that. But you were also denied the pleasure of curiosity, which is the pleasure of discovery, which is the pleasure you get. I, I mean, there's pleasure when you finally remember that thing that you <laughs> that remember the actress's name that you couldn't remember. But I think the pleasure that curiosity can afford is even greater than that. When it, it can just open up this whole new world. Right. So childhood can be a time when you're curious and you explore, and you discover, and that's fun and exciting. So you want to do it more, and you want to do it more, and you want, and that was never, you never had that either. So you weren't no. allowed to play in your curiosity and see the ways in which you could enrich your life. Yeah, I mean, I can't really, I can't really think of a time when I think back on pretty much my entire life where that was a main feature that drove my behaviors, curiosity. It just wasn't. It wasn't that I didn't explore things or research things, but those things I think were mostly driven by some kind of secondary reason. Like say, when I was friends with this person we talked about, E, exploring the things that I explored during, during the conversations I had with him were still not necessarily driven by emotional curiosity. And they certainly weren't directed interpersonally. No, right. So if you had any curiosity about topics or something, they were never 
interpersonal. There was never, it was never other people and it was never really about yourself. No. And I came up with reasons and excuses for that. I, I felt as though I, uh, had kind of disdain for people who just, you know, I kind of lumped everyone who talked about other people at all in any way as gossipers or something like that. Or they're just, oh, that's all they can talk about is other people Did because didn't, I didn't feel the ability to. And you didn't really understand what they were doing. No, I didn't. Right. So you had this kind of defensive or passive posture rather than an active posture, particularly in interpersonal situations. Kind of across the board. It's much safer to say just research the music industry or something. So yeah, even in that friendship I was talking about, the, the, the way that we talked to each other was mostly just exchanging information, but waiting for the other person to provide information. So it wouldn't be like, ah, tell me what you're feeling. You seem sad today. Like, why is that? You know, it, it's, not, it's not seeking information, and emotional information on the other person. It's kind of waiting for the other person to say something. And you felt that you were across the board that way as well. Yes. Like that's how you approached the world is you waited for information. Yeah, yeah. But you would be told the information. Very if... minimal. Like, I mean, I can even think of when I finally got into news or something, it's just like easy enough to just turn on the news and have them f- give me information or say the Facebook era of just scrolling and like, oh, there's a headline. I'm not even going to read the article. I'll read this headline there. I'm getting my news. So you were kind of like the ape in the transparent bowl. Yes. <laughs> you just went for the transparent yes, bowl. For sure. Yeah. Every time, like what was just right in front of you, you took it, but there was no, oh, maybe there's something over here. If I, if I look to the right slightly, maybe yeah. there's something else. Well, it's kind of interesting to think of the bowl idea because I probably turned over the opaque bowl in the early, early days. And sure. then, you know, I got my hand slapped for it. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, well. Or there's like, there was a monster underneath. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Never do that again. Mm-hmm. This led into your romantic relationships to what seemed to me an extreme lack of curiosity. Meaning when I met you and would ask you questions about RJ, because mm-hmm. I was curious. <laughs> yeah. You seem to know almost nothing about them. Yeah, that's right. I know. I mean, sometimes you would say, oh, yeah, she told me this little, this, this about her childhood or she said this about her previous marriage. And I'd be like, what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, tell me more. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and in both cases, it was very rare that I did get that kind of information. But, you know, as I've said, I got this information. This was given to me because of wh- however the conversation was going or something. I was never asking yeah. So do you remember asking them anything about their, say, their previous relationship or their previous sexual relationships no. or their family life? No. No, no. I mean, I, in, in a lot of cases, I actively didn't want to know. Not only did it feel unsafe for me to ask those kind of questions, in a lot of cases, I could almost feel, unconsciously mostly, that it was unsafe to even know these things. Like, so not only was it unsafe to ask, it was unsafe to know these things. Part of me can tell that, that this, I, I just, I need it to be like this. I mean, and it was the same thing in that friendship before too. Like, I can't ask him how he's feeling because I think he's going to say I'm depressed. And then what do we do about it? And similarly, not asking questions about yourself. Right. You had this way of responding often to my questions, particularly when I would ask you questions about things that were confusing to me about, say, your relationship with Jay, because that was the most pressing one at the time. And you would respond. Do you know what I'm going to say? Yeah, I do. What would, how would you respond? Well, who knows? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it's just there's no way to know that. Right. I mean, that is either, like, those, that exact phrase, who knows, or, or something similar, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of dismissing it. And these were right. not what's the meaning of life questions. No. These were not, to my mind, these were, these were noble things to my mind. Like, right. these were things that some of them you would just assume that people would know like you they because mm-hmm. i was asking you about your relationship you yeah, right my relationship right. or like my behavior why i behaved a certain yeah, way you right. know why'd you do that who knows sometimes even was why does she do that which you know is a little more removed but still like you were married to this person mm-hmm. <laughs> like you show some sense right right i could at least venture a guess i could yeah. you know so rather than saying who knows i could have at least said I, I i don't know i i could let me think about that i could right well and also someone knew <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Again, these aren't meaning of life questions. Yeah, Who knows? Uh, well, there is someone right, that knows. And you, we could, if you're not the person, then you could ask the person that knows, etc. I mean, I never developed this, the habit, I never developed the skill, whatever you want to call it, of the animating part of curiosity. So by the time I got there, it wasn't, it didn't feel all that foreign to me. I was especially afraid of my curiosity during those relationships, but it was very easy 
for me at that point to just, all right, well, I'm, I'm already used to just waiting for directions from people and waiting for information to come to me. So this is not that much of a leap. I didn't like go from being this super curious person and then having to shove it all in a box. Right. You had your emotional suppression skills down. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. And that was one that was suppressed very early on. So kind of like we described, not, not developed, not allowed to flourish, and then actively suppressed. Yeah. Both of those things are happening. So this was a little bit problematic right. for us. I think in the beginning, and we've talked about our beginning, which was great, fell in love, super exciting. It's like mm. super, super exciting time. But I think when we started getting to the point when we needed to translate that exciting being in love feeling to actual intimacy. And we had an episode on intimacy a while ago now. Yeah, that was a while back. So season, season three, three or four? Three or maybe? four? Yeah. Season four, I think. I'll link to it. You know, and we kind of, I think, just mentioned this difference between feeling like you know each other early on. Sure. It just feels like you've known this, this person forever and souls are meeting across time and space, but then translating into actual knowing and the way in which that involves self-knowledge and also knowledge of the real knowledge of the other person. Well, if, if you're not practiced in being curious about yourself or another person, that's a little difficult. So this is the whole deepening the connection piece, the way that curiosity is a tool from turning like more superficial even though they're exciting and feel incredible relationships into a more deep and intimate relationship. Curiosity is a big tool for that. And so that was an issue for us. Um, it took a while to surface. Yeah. To zero in on it. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause we had plenty of great conversations, but I think often it would be like what I was talking about where we're just exchanging things. Or it was driven by my curiosity. Or it was driven by you, right? I mean that. I was very curious about this whole, th <laughs> yes, whole mess. <laughs> that yes. Was. Well, I mean, I'll give you major props in that nine tenths, if not more, of the reason I am where I am now is because of your curiosity. So it didn't kill me. <laughs> no, it didn't. Kill <laughs> it didn't kill you. It didn't kill me. <laughs> you know, we talked about curiosity, feeling bad when it's not resolved, and feeling good when it's resolved. So if curiosity is pursued, and you make the discoveries it one gives you pleasure and then also resolves the uncertainty of not knowing and and so relieves the pain and it did that for us right it relieved a lot of the pain of not knowing that was present in our relationship and in your life and then it's given us a lot of pleasure to discover things about you and things about the way the world works learning that through your story but i i think it was probably maybe a couple of years in where it became more clear to me that yes, my curiosity about you and the larger world was animating our relationship to a greater degree than yours. Right. I think we, I actually called it a curiosity gap. Curiosity gap, kind of like, I mean, intimacy gap, which I think you've also used. And, it, and it's a similar, there's similar things behind it of why the gap is there, was there, is there to some extent. Being that, you know, it would be like, wow, we've learned so much. We've come so far. But then when I think about even the times that it seemed as though I was being curious, and I was, but you got me going on it most of the time for such a long period of time to where I didn't often go on my own steam. First, there was, why am I more curious about you and your past than you are? So, right. So that was kind of a problem early on. It was like, I want you to be as invested in learning about why you were in the relationship with Jay. Why were you in the relationship with R? What effect did actually G have on your life? Like, I want you to be invested in those and curious about that as I am, even though I realized it was more difficult for you. And then when we got through that and we made, had made a lot of progress in resolving a lot of that uncertainty and pain, it was kind of like, I don't think you were asking me questions. I mean, now I know, we know a lot about you. <laughs> what do you know about me? What, right, are, you, what right. are you curious about me? What are you curious about in terms of my past relationship, my past experiences, my current internal life? And you just were still kind of in passive mode. Yes. It was hard to spot because I was still in passive mode even throughout the whole discovery process of myself because it would be you initiating these things like, what about this? You know, you'd be actually asking a question. Mm -hmm. like, hmm, I don't know. I, and I might spend a week, a month thinking about it. And it feels as though I was being curious and exploring things and all that. But, but you got the ball rolling. I didn't get the ball rolling on that stuff. And it was directed at yourself. It yeah. wasn't directed at me. I know it wasn't directed at you. So yeah, I mean, we had huge chunks of times where you weren't the focus at all because I'm not doing that same work. 
one of the problems with that, with not feeling curiosity directed at me, is, I mean, we, we hear it described as a desire, a passion, a love. Mm-hmm. That's one way to express that. To express your desire, your passion, or love for someone is to be curious about them yeah. and to direct curiosity at them so that you not directing curiosity at me means that I'm not feeling, <laughs> I'm not feeling the love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it, you know, you say you desire me, you have a passion for me, then why aren't you interested in me, right? right. Like, why don't you want to know me? You don't seem to be demonstrating a love or a desire or a passion because this is one very easy thing to point to that would be evidence of that it re- reminds me of a similar thing we went through with emotions where i was like i feel these emotions but i can't i have the hardest time expressing them outwardly the curiosity thing was a similar thing and i think when it came to feeling and expressing my emotions that one was especially urgent and that was one that i addressed earlier on because that was causing some major issues but then this is too this is all part of a package but i never still struggled to tap in to what the curiosity emotion felt like kind of similar to empathy too was sort of has has been kind of a late blooming one for me the thing is is i could tell internally that i was completely fascinated by you and wanted to know about you but i didn't know how to express that and i didn't even know that i didn't know how to express that it was it's this like kind of there was like more than one level of this than just like oh i'm curious i really want to know x but I'm too afraid to ask it or something. Like I had this kind of gatekeeper that is just so accustomed to you. So you tell me something, ah, okay, that's fascinating. Yes, that's great. I'm getting some good information here. But for whatever reason, I could not internalize that curiosity as as coming from myself. And you couldn't translate that into exploratory behavior. Yes. I mean, it's almost like you see a nail, you want to drive that nail into the wood and there's a hammer there, but you're like, what? I don't yeah, uh, how do these go together? Uh, do these go together? Do these go together? Am I allowed to pick this hammer up? <laughs> you know, and the, the whole act of picking up the hammer and hitting the nail is just kind of foreign and frightening. And right. So this is, again, a curiosity. It's this tool and you trying to relearn how to use it in your life. And the way we started maybe wasn't ideal because I would be kind of, you know, I would say this. I think there's this curiosity gap. You don't really ask me questions. I don't mm-hmm. really feel an interest being directed at me. And you, and you would say some version of what you just said. Yeah. And I'd be like, okay, well, ask me a question. Right. Oh, man. <laughs> like, if you're so interested, then just ask me a question. That yeah. seemed to me a pretty easy ask. It wasn't meant to be performed for me. It was meant I need to feel that from you. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm feeling undesired. Can you express interest in me? That would help me. But you took it. I took it as performed for me. Yeah. And, and, and this is the big, huge problem. And this performance thing has not completely died with me. And, and this is something like a thread that I've really started to, to notice and recognize is making it a mission to really, really get to the motivational root. And the motivational root being actual emotions. The motivational root of any particular behavior. Right. So I know that humans are motivate you know curiosity can can and does be motivated by passion and desire and love but for me curiosity for whatever reason is mo- was motivated by fear and shame and what what I'm looking for what needs to be expected of me or I need to satisfy something you mean curious behavior was motivated yeah, by that yeah the behavior of curiosity but then there's the second layer of it for me which is like how do I clean that up in my mind that that is the beha- that my behavior seems to be motivated by, by fear. Well, it's also, I need to stunt it internally. So you ask me, ask me a question, or there's lots of other examples of that where you just ask a simple, another one being like, oh, play some music or something, and then suddenly there's this sea of music and I can't even zero in on one artist or song or anything, and it's just a blank, my mind is blank. And it's, so it's a similar thing, ask me a question, well, geez, that could be anything. I could, oh, wow, all right, I can ask you anything. Well, I, I can't even think of anything mm-hmm. at all. Like my mind just is completely blank. And then, yeah, you're just like, wow, all right. I guess <laughs> you're not, not curious at all. There's not one thing you want to know about me, Nothing. right? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that didn't go particularly well for, for quite a while. Yeah. Although you did, I mean, one strategy you did to try to, I guess, address this situation or kind of relearn, reconnect to curiosity is you 
kind of did the fake it till you make it thing, mm -hmm. which actually didn't really work out that well. No, I know. <laughs> so you, I think you kind of went back to your old toolkit and did the thing where you came up with a list of questions mm -hmm. <laughs> that people may ask yep. someone. And then you would ask me those, which you know, I guess is better than nothing. And it did lead to some good conversations, but it also sometimes made me feel bad because it made me feel like you were treating this like a homework assignment. Yeah, right. Because it was not animated mm -hmm. by your own curiosity, animated by your desire to know me and your understanding of me as a separate person worth knowing. So that's really the work that you needed to do was to reconnect to your emotions, the emotions around curiosity. And that's the work that you're still doing. I'm still doing. Yes. This is not, th this is one, we're doing an episode on this, but it's this in no way, I'm in no way good at this yet. This is something, this is a, a very much a work in progress and, and maybe we'll do another episode six months from now or something where we talk. Cause I, I have ideas of ways to just kind of generally get myself motivated by my own desire for for curiosity which is a huge shift it doesn't sound like it should be but this gatekeeper's been there for a really long time this gatekeeper that says that i don't have the right or it's it's too something it's too scary it's too i may uncover shame i may uncover expectations i, I may disagree with someone and then what do i do and it's, there's too much this something bad might happen if i even think about being curious a reason that I think it's such important work, we both think it is, we've talked about yes. it a lot, is near the beginnings of a relationship, curiosity is really important to translate, to move into real intimacy. But then in the long middle years, it's really critical for staying connected. Yes, right. To the work of staying connected. Because it is an expression of desire and passion. And regularly engaging in it, I think, goes a long way in keeping that passion and desire at the heart of the connection. You stop being curious about the other person when you start to think you know everything there is to know. Right. Then it veers into enmeshment. You're just kind of plastered together. Mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but like the construct that we talked about in season four or five, I don't know, can't keep track anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the me, you, us, that there's yes. three elements to this relationship. There's me, as a separate autonomous person, there's you as a separate autonomous person in the relationship that we share. And if, if we are, continue to be separate people who are choosing to come together out of desire, there's always going to be something to discover about the other person. You can never fully know yourself, but you can really never fully know someone else because, first of all, they're always changing. No, right. It, yeah, it changes. Things change. I don't know everything about myself now. So, it, you know, and then what I do learn is may just change, too. So the minute you stop being curious is also the, when you start taking the other person for granted. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else I need to know. And then so then when you come across a change, often there's resentment. It's yeah. like, how dare this person change? I, you know, they always liked this. They always did this. Right. It's like, well, you weren't curious about the person. How do you know it? Uh -huh. <laughs> you can't expect someone to be the same person and have the same relationship with you for 20, 30, 40 years. Like if you're going to stay connected, you have to be curious about each other. Yeah, we've ha we've talked about this before too. That the the idea of suddenly waking up one day and being completely disconnected sounds hard to imagine because of the fact that we talk every single day. We we work on this connection, but I could see how that would happen if you if you're just kind of resting on this knowledge that you think you have of the other person and of yourself, and you're not exercising any curiosity at all, other than what did you do today? You know some logistical curiosity or something. I think actually that the curiosity gap conversation kind of happened after you were expressing that view that you couldn't see us being disconnected. And then I was kind of suddenly realized, but there's this whole other element to our relationship. There's my experience that really hasn't been explored. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I could totally see us being disconnected. I, I mean, I think you felt that because... We talked about you every, at that point. It was really, we talked about it every day, but really it was about you and, yeah. and somewhat about us. The me portion was very diminished. So, right. To, but now that there's more attention paid to all those elements. and But this needs, to, again, curiosity to be directed at all of those elements. You need to be curiosity directed at me, from me, and from you, at you, 
and the needs to be curiosity directed at our relationship. Is this relationship still working for the two of us? Is it still arranged the way we want it to arrange, et cetera? And for my sake, something that I have really, really found important to keep in mind is to be sure that I've made that shift and, and I'm always making sure that I'm coming from a place of desire and choice and autonomy and not coming from a place of performance. You know, this is something you really wanted. You, you want me to be curious in you. So I have to make sure that I'm doing that because you asked for it. Well, it's also a very empowering stance, like for yourself as well, right? Mm -hmm. We've kind of used it to approach some difficult conversations, including difficult conversations with, with other people. You've had to have some conversations with other people recently, some potentially difficult ones, and yes. in kind of thinking about them and anticipating them, if you can shift from a performance mode in terms of, oh, what is that person going to say? And how am I going to respond? And, yeah. oh, but then maybe they'll argue this and how am I going to counter that? Which again is performance mode. Mode, shifting that into curiosity mode. Oh, I wonder, I legitimately wonder what ex that person is experiencing. I'm curious about how they'll represent that experience. I'm curious about what they'll say. It, I, I think it's a much more empowering way to approach the world. Yes. And it's much easier to, to have empathy be involved in that too. The, the two really play off each other. Because when I'm in that performance mode, I'm really not thinking about the other person. I'm thinking about how they're going to be talking to me and, and how I'm going to perform. And then how is it going to be left? Will it be a success? So similarly in conversations with us, you know, if we're having maybe a difficult conversation or a conversation where, where we're at odds, if we can shift from, okay, I'm responding to this other person as if they're a threat or we're, we're in conflict. What if I respond with curiosity? What if I try to change my orientation and, and respond, ask questions driven by my own curiosity rather than say asking questions to trap them or asking questions yeah, to confuse right. them or to make your point. Or if you're going on a date or in a lean startup methodology episode, treating dating as an experiment to test hypotheses about whether this is a, a person in a relationship that you want to, to be in. Again, going into those social environments, those dating environments, not with performance, performance mm -hmm. mode, not I'm going to perform and they're going to perform. I'm going to measure performances, but with curiosity, this is an opportunity to discover another person. Right. And I think once again, that's something that, you know, I, I fell into all the performance traps and that seems to be a pretty common thing that I think happened to people. They fall into that, that trap and they forget why it is they're even interacting with people. Cause exploratory behavior again, has been evolutionarily advantageous to us for millions of years. And there is an absolutely advantage to being a curious person because information is the currency of evolution. Uh -huh, I like that. The more information that you get, the better you're going to be able to navigate the world. So when you're, sh you know, when we talked about that extensively, when you shut down your emotions, how you're shutting down such a huge source of information about the world. And definitely curiosity, when you shut off curiosity, you're shutting off this avenue to go out into the world and gather information. Because there's no winners and losers with curiosity, unless, you know, it kills the cat, then the cat's losing. <laughs> sure. You can <laughs> so still make I'm not saying unbridled, like, right. still need to make good decisions. Like, don't go on a date with, like, a serial killer, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the extremes aside, there's no winning and losing in curiosity. You always get information. Yeah, right. That you can use to make your life better and that you can use to make your relationship better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not exploring curiosity is has the opposite effect. You can go years and just get into this trench that mm -hmm. you that becomes really difficult to get out of. So I'm finding more and more every day how much better it is being out of this trench and having this whole horizon of, of life available to me. It's a big, wide, wonderful world. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's our thoughts on uh, curiosity and this ongoing shift that I'm trying to get myself to really harness. And we are curious, legit, on how you, the listener, have experienced curiosity in your life. Does this resonate with you? Have you struggled with exploring your inner and outer worlds? And let us know. You can leave a comment on Spotify, on some of the platforms. <laughs> or, of course, you can reach us on Facebook and on Instagram and via email at codependentmind at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you.